What's your advice for CIOs for getting an enterprise scale masking solution off the ground? And can you break it down into three points? Sure. Well, uh, data masking is like any other application, right? So if you want to go enterprise scale, you've got to be concerned with scalability, complexity, customization. The thing is that by and large, Delphix has already solved those problems. So we have things like hyperscale, which lets you solve that scalability problem. We have a domain-based approach to rule definition, which sort of changes the complexity problem. And you can pretty much use our interfaces to customize, configure your own rules pretty directly. So sort of the real culprits that are behind or that inhibit real progress if you're using our product. First, it's sort of this idea of iteration. If you really want to go to system-wide scale, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's important to iterate and not to sort of put things serially, put them in like, you know, data dictionary order. Uh, and what I mean by that is a lot of times when we're building the model of, of all the things that need to be masked across an enterprise scale, it's good for one application to inform another because that sort of library of domains expands quickly and it gets you a lot farther down the line to what we call sort of the surface area of risk being reduced, right? And no matter what you do in, in data masking, because of the way the algorithms are constructed, they're always, they're always going to be eager which is to say they'll always ask for more. So iteration is a good thing to start with. That, that uh, corollary is parallelization, right? The second thing is make sure that you can parallelize what you're doing. So don't force them to fix the data dictionary first. Do that on the side as long as you're also doing onboarding of new applications. And, and for an, an application like ours, there's going to be a, a, an initial hump, but then the, the curve is going to fall pretty quickly because the amount of sharing and the amount of reuse you get is pretty high as you move forward. And then lastly, I would say it's important, especially for people in the security space to rethink controls. A lot of the controls that exist, they exist because of risks that a lot of times we make incomplete or, or make unnecessary anymore. If I, if I may be something to the point where you may have a large control structure around how to provision a piece of data, but that may be premised on the idea that it's hard to provision data, it's hard to get the data back, and if someone messes it up, they might stuff the box. But the way uh, our software works, none of those things are true anymore. So a lot of those controls and processes that you have can really inhibit your your speed, your velocity to getting to scale, and those are some of the things you can do uh, to, to really change that equation. Great. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that, laying that out. Um, I want to go back to the three points that you just made and kind of take them one by one. Um, the first point that you made is that it's important to iterate. Um, what are the best practices that CIOs can implement when they're trying to iterate these uh, enterprise scale masking solutions? Well, it, it, there's something called the profiler. And the idea behind the profiler is to look both at the semantic of the data itself, as well as the semantic of the field name for that data. And when we iterate through there, Right. We're, we're first of all, we're discovering. Right. So we're figuring out what's important. We're we're measuring that against the list of data that you already have. But the idea of onboarding shouldn't be coupled right to the idea of building that dictionary. They inform each other and the people that go the fastest, let them do that. Right. And, and part of this problem actually relies on something that's a little bit deeper called the dark data problem. Right. Which is to say that whenever you go to any sort of enterprise scale with this, there's always going to be fields that are ambiguous or fields that are overloaded or they have semantically mis misnamed names or just a bunch of different things that can happen where you're not really getting to the right answer uh, and you need that those iterations to sort of get you there and there's really no way to get around that um, because a lot of it is pretty deep in, into its complexity so when we use our profiler we're able to really accelerate that a lot to give you an example i had a customer once that run the profiler through their um, team of, of, of data experts. And they said, well, we've got about 167 fields before we ran the profiler that they think were sensitive. Our profiler found over 660 that were sensitive. So it's a, it's a big mismatch in terms of what humans will find versus what the automated profile will find because of the semantics of the human. Gotcha. Appreciate it. Um, the next thing that you mentioned was parallelization, um, doing certain tasks alongside other tasks. What are some best practices that CIOs can implement when trying to parallelize while implementing these sorts of solutions? Sure. So, so I would say, first of all, you have to have a, a different mindset. 
you can't get to mass data perfection iteration zero. It's because of that eagerness. So naturally, a data masking solution will err on the side of caution all the time. So when you iterate, you're actually pulling back from the maximum list back to the list that's more appropriate for your organization. Because anytime it sees anything that matches a sensitive field, right, it's going to say, yes, you should mask this. And then you've got to decide, well, is that really reasonable? The, the issue can become, though, that people will want to do all those iterations before they do anything else. And, and that can be pretty damaging to your velocity, right? You, you need to do that at the beginning a couple of times because you need to sort of build the baseline dictionary. But once you've gone past that, you need to add a lot more in sequence, right? Because you're going to take advantage of that economy of scale. And it's not a linear kind of process, right? It, it sort of curves down pretty quickly because if you can imagine other solutions build themselves based on a lot of very complex rules. But Delvix really looks at the domain rule, the domain level rule. And that means that that rule, it's very simple. It's very reusable. And as you add new things on, the actual margin of net new rules is pretty small. And that means you can add more applications faster. Awesome. And then the last point that you made was that um, CIOs need to rethink controls. What are the biggest missteps that they make, they typically make when they're thinking about these controls, like kind of the typical things that they think of versus where they need to go with it? Sure. So these controls are actually more in the space of the data set itself. Uh, and, and that's because change control can be hard. Um, it's usually, you know, paired with the assumption that masking is slow or it's infrequent or it's hard. And as a result, no one wants to do it very often. But in fact, it's the frequency that helps you go faster. And that's sort of counterintuitive to most people. So the, the idea is to understand why you have change control. And a lot of times change control is, you know, I don't, I don't want to stuff the box. I don't want to ruin my data set. I don't want something to be destroyed that I can't get back. But when you sort of put together the, the power of our, our continuous data, our virtualization with masking, you really make all those problems sort of go away. You've reached a point where the person who's asking for the data can't really destroy the data. They can't mess it up and they can't stuff the box. And that means that the need to, to sort of have those controls is severely diminished. But also on the other side of the equation, when you're using some of our features, for example, a selective data distribution is a feature that Delphix has, you can actually, with high velocity, deliver mass data downstream almost immediately, right? And the only time that it, that it sort of takes a little bit longer is if you ask to, for it to mask it as of this instant. But you could have data that's masked an hour ago delivered downstream within a couple of minutes. And that's very powerful in terms of keeping the data fresh. And so that that velocity upends a lot of the way we think about our controls and the the risk that we have associated to it. Awesome. Really appreciate it. I appreciate you going into detail about those three specific things. Now, I want to shift gears and talk about something else. Um, in your survey, you mentioned that ChatGPT is a really big deal. It's a really big story that's going on right now. So I want to ask you, how can DevOps TDM be combined with generative AI to improve enterprise development? Well, I, maybe we should level set a little first. What is DevOps TDM? Um, so from the perspective of someone who maybe doesn't know what it is, it's basically the power of thin cloning, data privacy protection, and DevOps automation sort of wrapped together in a single unit. And if you're a chat GPT or llama junkie like I am, it's important to realize that Gen AI has strengths and it has weaknesses. So on the strength side, it's great at pattern recognition, right? So if you're doing data masking or data pipelining, discovery, reproducibility, generating new data. Those are all great things for Gen AI. But when it comes to its limitations, it often lacks what we might call common sense. It could ignore semantic cues. And in, when I used to work for the CIA of the Army, we called this the, the tank problem. Is it a water tank? Is it a gas tank? Is it an armament tank? And when it misses those cues, it can do wrong things. Also, it can be true that the training data that you use can be subject to bias or drift. So there's a lot of things you have to think about that are maybe different than the problems you have now and maybe less expensive, but there's still weaknesses. So in terms of, of for us, I think automated sensitive data discovery, that's something I think that's probably on the horizon for us. We already offer some uh, advanced masking skills with things called classifiers. Uh, and I have seen in our, in our uh, I guess, our innovation labs, I've seen some people working with automated sensitive data discovery using Gen AI, and it's pretty interesting. The other side of that tool might be natural language processing, also in our experimental labs, which 
Uh, I've seen some work on that with data discovery and classification as well. So when you put that together, the last piece is that pipelining. And I guess the, the dirty secret of AI or ML or anything you know, of that nature is that technical debt and ML or AI technical debt, well, it's almost the same stuff, right? So instead of complaining about how bad our data is in terms of our technical debt uh, or our code is, we'll start complaining about how out of date our gen AI is, right? So we will shift the problem, but there's always going to be something that blocks us, right? So it, I think there's plenty of promise, but I don't think we have to think of it as like the, you know, the, the panacea for all possible problems. And on that note, um, how do you see generative AI evolving with DevOps TDM, you know, over the next few years? Well, with the, with the advent of some of the the, the newer models, uh, I think it's clear that that synthetic data generation is on the horizon. Uh, with with Gen AI, uh, there's going to be um, lots of different training uh, on data sets. And, and I think that that training will you know, involve you know, sampling, data typing, pattern matching. We're, we're going to get to a point where there's a lot less of that drudge work to do for people. Uh, I also think that you know, from the viewpoint of automation, you know, we're going to get to a point where maybe chat GPT could be the interface that people use to actually set these things in motion, right? Hey, can you mask this database for me? Or or whatever, right? So it's a it's a level of automation for for definitely for drudge work at the lowest level and probably for the second level. At the top level, there's still some some room there. I think in the next three three to four year horizon, where there's going to be a lot of thought work around those things we talked about, which is the the idea of confusing semantics or ambiguously defined things. Gen AI is definitely it has difficulty when you get it to a complex complex multi layered problem or or novel thinking, right? So it's going to have difficulty in those spaces. So I would expect experts to be the ones working on those parts of the problem when Gen AI becomes part of the solution set. Awesome. Um, Want to shift gears again and kind of look at the enterprise from a bird's eye level perspective with this next question. Um, can you name three examples of enterprise level problems that DevOps TDM, aka Delphix, uh, can solve? and talk about how it solves those problems. Okay. Well, I, I think the first thing is is uh, is the analogy we have to DevOps itself, right? DevOps has really classically been more about code. Um, but if you think about it, uh, if you think of your enterprise as a software factory, data plays an important part in that factory. And you know, over the last several years, we've seen a lot of different companies take on the idea of how do I make that factory profitable. And that's a function of things like throughput or efficiency or inventory. So DevOps TDM has effects both on the code side of the house and on the data side of the house, right? So for data uh, intensive operations, it can have an order of magnitude, simplicity and, and speed impact. Uh, as a developer, for example, right? If you can get fresh relevant data on demand, that means whatever you're doing, you can do faster. It means that the idea of the inversion of, of batch size and frequency becomes possible for you, even if you need a terabyte database to test with or whatever it is, right? And that means that not only can you work on what you're working on faster, but you can switch context faster. And I, and I spoke to a couple of leads of engineering and they say their number one problem is that they can't context switch fast enough. But it's pretty much bread and butter with Delphix to swap one data set out for another in four or five minutes. And that means that if I've got three work streams working, I can switch between the work streams, no problem, right? Go get my coffee, come back, I'm ready to go. And that analogy holds at the workstation level, the assembly line level, and the whole factory level, right? There's all sorts of different ways that a factory gets optimized that get impacted. From the, the data perspective, right? If you think about what's going on in that factory, that data needs privacy protection as well. Right, especially when you want to make it seamless and in line, you need to have that in place, right? And that can be important when you want to do, for example, offshore testing. So are you going to ship real data offshore? Of course not. But how long does it take you to get data that's shippable offshore? How fresh is that data? And importantly with DevOps, right? One of the, the insights of DevOps is that by having batch sizes too large or release cycles too infrequent, you can actually increase the number of errors that you spend time working on, right? And so we want to tackle that problem as well from the data perspective. And then, you know, another great example might be cloud migration, right? If you think about cloud migration, it's it's a 
it's a bunch of rehearsals followed by a cutover. And those rehearsals involve lots of different trees of patching and lots of different tests and maybe conformance to a spec of a different kind of hardware standard or you're moving to Amazon from your on-prem or whatever it is. But there's a lot of time that gets lost when things go wrong or somebody does the wrong thing or things go in the wrong order or whatever. And that power that Delphix has, that, that time flow, that ability to bookmark a data set and recover that bookmark in a moment's notice makes it very easy to go stepwise through those things and to lose only the last step instead of the last hour or the last day. So that kind of velocity really helps you with these problems that might be outside the developer or the tester, right? Give you that velocity that you need. Gotcha. I appreciate it. Um, going back to that question, um, I was thinking about how, you know, technology leaders might not necessarily have the same vantage point into uh, DevOps TDM or these solutions that, you know, developers might. Is there something that pops into your mind as far as like issues that DevOps TDM can solve that often enterprise leaders might not think of, but that could be really useful to them? Interesting question. So, you know, DevOps TDM, it, it upends some of the, the basic ideas of how things work, right? So here's an example. Um, for DevOps TDM, the fastest, cheapest data is also the freshest. It's a little counterintuitive because we're used to a system, for example, that there's all sorts of controls and people have to submit tickets and there's all sorts of wait time and this, that, and the other thing. And what will happen is a developer, for example, well, instead of waiting for this long process, we'll just say, well, I'll just code it myself. I'll just fix this myself. I'll roll it back myself. But those are all examples of, of waste and rework that don't need to exist. And so when you upend that equation, when you say the, the previous ideas that I had no longer apply, you get to take that out of the system, right? And that, that's actually quite valuable because when we take that to enterprise scale, uh, our data shows across, you know, longitudinally across hundreds of customers that this is on average in the 35, 40% range, right? So we're talking about taking big poles out of the tent and making a lot more productivity happen. One of our, our major customers, Dell, in fact, their focus time for, for the developers tripled, almost quadrupled because of this kind of, of interchange, right? And that was after they already had DevOps maturity. So data has a real impact, right? And it, it can have an outsized impact when you don't have DevOps maturity, but even when you do, it has a pretty significant impact. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate you going to depth about that. Um, you talked also about um, how two infrequent release cycles can create errors, and that goes really well into my next question. Um, can you explain the importance of release cycle speed to those who may not think they need to release software very often? Like why, and also talk about why or how the speed of these release cycles are confusing to users? Sure. Um, well, well, I think it's probably obvious to anybody like, you know, frequency goes up, batch size goes down, right? So if you release more frequently, then you have fewer things to release. The thing is though, and, and this is sort of the premise of DevOps uh, itself, is that those things aren't equal, right? The throughput of, of less frequent cycles with more stuff in them is less than the throughput of more frequent cycles with less stuff in them. How can that be? Well, it's because you don't spend your time chasing type one and two, two errors. You don't spend your time fixing stuff that should never have existed. You get the freshest version instead of the old version. So you don't code the wrong thing in the first place. Adding all that up means that productivity rises a lot because you're stopping the error when it's cheapest. And, and, and I often will get into a meeting with a, a CISO or an SVP or somebody where they talk to me about their people are, are their, you know, my people are never not busy. Well, you're right. The question is not, are they not busy? The question is, is what they're doing valuable? And, and, and that's the real insight uh, of that is that that tree of weight, waste, and rework, it just gets bigger as, as the release cycles get more infrequent. And so you can get a lot of value without even changing your staff by just changing that one parameter and going faster. This is really why, in fact, you think about someone like Amazon, the, the, it's called the unicorn effect, right? Amazon releases faster than anybody on earth and their code velocity increases away from other people because they're able to do so much with that sort of approach. And, and this is honestly, this is why 
all the big SIs are have embraced DevOps because they know it works. When people talk about release cycles and speeding that up, what are typically the biggest fears that customers face with improving DevOps and getting to real CI CD? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, you have to begin with culture. Culture is the big problem, right? And and it's almost always unspoken in the background. And, and the reality is that people want control, right? But there are also some people that want to avoid accountability. And given the choice in a lot of places, people will avoid change because it's the least risky option, right? So for companies on that DevOps journey, it's a true culture shift. So what I like to tell folks like this is, you know, what, what can we do to help you? And, and so we we give you help in a couple different ways, right? Um, first, how do we make it so that if you make a mistake, it's not as onerous, not as difficult, not as expensive, right? And that that power exists inside of our time flow, right? That bookmarking means that if I'm bookmarking all along as I do something, if I make a mistake, the cost isn't yesterday's backup, it's the five minute ago bookmark. And and as you push that more and more towards the end user, towards the developer, it means that they have more and more power to get back to where they worked and back to work faster, right? So that, that risk comes down for them and, and that sort of psychological safety around change it goes down some, right? The The idea of control, well, so there's a couple different schools of thought here, right? So people still need control, but the things they're controlling for might need to change. And if you think about why we control all of our data so tightly, it's because it's so expensive, it's heavy, it's hard to get it back. When you provision it, it could be a long time to reprovision it. But the whole idea behind continuous data, behind thin provisioning, thin cloning is, all that stuff, it becomes so much easier, so much faster. So when we do that, it gives us an easy way to have more control to the developer, but the actual data itself is in the control of the administrator per se. Um, we, we call that the separation between the operators and the administrators. But essentially, it gives you the power to say, look, here's a safe space that you can play in. You can do whatever you need to in this space, but you can only use one thing out of your library at a time. That means that they can have the library and they can easily switch between them, but they can't stuff the box. They can't overload the box. They can't get to a point where they're going to destroy data because you decide if data gets destroyed, not them. And, and so that's a very powerful way to sort of reduce that risk. Um, and then in terms of, of, uh, of, of automation, right, it's all about building pipelines to automate this as much as possible. So the, the nirvana from the DevOps TDM perspective is to try to get to a point where the risks and the change in risk is so well understood that everyone can agree to automate the pipeline, maybe with just one step for a final human approval, but to get sort of take as much as that out of the service as possible so that we don't have to wait at all anymore for things to go out. We know what's where. Gotcha. Now I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit with this next question. Um, just give you a little scenario not giving you a ton of details with this, but let's say you're talking to you're talking to a prospect, someone who's a DevOps professional, and they're saying, okay, you're talking about increasing these release cycles. We already release software updates about once every other week. And our teams are working in harmony. The pipeline's great. Why do we need to increase our release cycle speed? Okay. Well, so if you're working at that pace. The, the question becomes, you know, within your sprints, could your sprints be more effective? Could you get the sprint done with fewer people? First of all, could you get the sprint done in, in five days instead of 10 days? Right. It, it's all, it all becomes the economics of, 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 of software delivery. Can you do what you do today? You sure you could, but the question is, how are we going to maximize the throughput of the factory? How are we going to maximize the efficiency of the factory? Right. So, to suggest that just because this works that we can't go better, faster, and cheaper, that's just not true, right? Th there are, are plenty of, of reasons why people will tell you no, but at the end of the day, if you are someone who has to get through a lot of code, a lot of delivery, right? You need to go as fast as you possibly can, right? And, and that means increasing your automation. It means making data automation a central piece of what you do. It means making provisions and rollbacks and refreshes and so forth and automated process as much as possible. It means 
building ephemeral data pipelines so that if you need to deliver mass data downstream to a testing group, that's a one minute operation, not a three hour operation or a three day operation. And every time we we sort of shave that 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 time frame down, we get to a lot more throughput, a lot more efficiency. I've seen it many times. We've had customers that have gone from sort of the once a month to the once a week who are now at the 10,000 per year kind of level, right? It's just night and day in terms of what the throughput is. The um, the velocity is crazy. One of the customers w- used to be testing a couple hundred thousand um, uh, pipelines a month. Now they're into the millions, right? Imagine how much money you save just by doing that. Imagine how much left shifted out of production into bugs that you fixed before it got there. That money is real money. That was great. I appreciate that. Um, so for customers who are adopting DevOps, but they're stuck at the crawl stage, what do they typically need to do to move forward? Well, I, I would go back to the previous answer, right? Is is that you, you can't you can't solve everything in a day, right? And you can't go too fast for the culture to adopt. So you want to start with things that are are easy, the low-hanging fruit, right? So typically that's how do I make data as automated as possible right now within the framework I already have. So I want to ingest those that portfolio of data sources, right? So let's suppose that I, I'm, uh, I have an application that has a, a production source and say eight or 10 downstreams, right? Dev, test, QA, whatever. I want to ingest that production source. I want to provision all those downstream sources. And then I want to be able to very easily, either through the administrator or if they feel comfortable to the actual developer themselves, get a refresh of that going in a few minutes, right? That alone won't change any of the rules around how they do things, but it will create a lot of data velocity in their system. And that's the point at which once they've got that going for a little while, right? Maybe they've got it successful. They've got it going for three or four weeks. Now it's time to start thinking about, well, do these processes that we have for provisioning and controlling data, do they really make sense anymore? What will we change about them? What could make it more automated? Do we really need to protect against a risk that no longer exists? Usually that part there gets you in the door. It starts to get people excited about what's going on and gets you moving along to the first stage. Uh, There's other stages after that, but that definitely uh, almost always involves rethinking how you do things altogether to take advantage of the velocity you can get out of DevOps TDM. How does DevOps TDM lower the threshold of change for enterprises? Well, uh, you have to think about what it costs to do any sort of technical debt reduction and why it's so difficult, right? So data, just like code, has technical debt, right? You have overloaded fields. You have people that have not cleaned out old values. You may have data quality issues. You may have old versions of data sets that are using for testing. There's just a thousand different reasons why, um, why things are like that. When you try to clean that up, or when you try to, to sort of homogenize and standardize it, just like today, if you don't have a solution like Delphix, you spend a lot of time when you mess up, right? So I can recall doing this, doing some data quality work and getting something wrong and having to roll all sorts of stuff back, realizing I didn't have a backup. And then, oh, now I'm in real trouble. Now I got to go figure out what it looked like six weeks ago, try to roll it forward from what I did. You could end up going down a wild goose chase for three weeks, right? To get it back to where it was so that you could actually test it correctly, right? But having that that perfect high fidelity point in time and many points in time, um, a time flow of a data set and a, and a set of data sets in this case, right? Means that if I make a mistake, even if I make a mistake that impacts all eight of the data sets or nine of the data sets in my data flow, I'm just one transaction away from getting it back in 10 minutes. Right, and that just changes the the threshold of change. The cost of changes goes to the floor. Right, we're talking about at least one, if not two orders of magnitude less work, and that super important, right, for your velocity. Well, uh, thank you so much for sitting down for this, Woody. I really appreciate it. You provided us a lot of great details. Um, my head's already spinning with ideas for content based on the answers that you gave. And thank you again.